Okay, everybody, we're getting ready to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. Oh. It is the biggie. This one's key. Okay, you ready? Let me write it up first. We're not going to spend very much time on the lecture for this, because really, in practice, it's a very simple, it's, it's a simple deal. I'm going to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus to you. Okay, but let's see what it says first, and let's sort of process this. I'm going to define a funky-looking function, okay, and it may freak you out. I'm going to define g of x as being the integral from a to x of f of t dt, all right? And I'm going to say that x is between some two values, a and b, all right? Now, remember, this is what's really important is f is, it has to be continuous, because what we're going to do here is we're going to prove that the way in which to find an integral is actually to take the antiderivative of it. All right, now watch how I'm going to do this. Think about this. If I've defined g as this crazy looking function, then let's think about a few things first. So here we go. I've got, let's say, some function from a to b. Uh, let's make this f of x and I'm going to call this A, and I'm going to call this B. And I'm going to pick any value in between. So to prove that G of X is actually a function, all that we really have to prove is that for every value of X that we get, we only get one value of, of this guy. In other words, if I plug in a value of X, G of X isn't going to give me two values, otherwise I'd lose my function. So if I let X be here, so I'm going to call this X1 for lack of a better term, do you agree that the area from a to x1 is fixed. In other words, there's no way for me, because f is continuous, there's no way for me to grab two areas. Same thing here. If I grab x2 here, then the area from a to x2 is also fixed. True? This is going to have some value of, I don't know, call it a1. This is going to have some value because it's going to be the whole thing of a2. So g of x1 is just going to be a1 g of x2 is just going to be a2, because remember, g is defined as the integral from a to x of f of t. All right, ooh, I wrote f of x, didn't I? I wanted this to be an f of t. The reason that we don't write it as f of x, I can call it whatever I want. I can call it f of z if I want. But what I can't have is these two variables being the same. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. All right, so you ready? Here's the fundamental theorem of calculus. It simply says, suppose, it's so elegant and so simple, suppose that g of x is equal to, wow, my stylus is giving me troubles again, is equal to the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Throw my parentheses in here. Then, now you could almost finish this all by yourself. This implies that g primed of x is equal to what? g primed of x is equal to the derivative of an integral. So what should pop out is f. But the crazy part is it's not going to be f of t because it can't be. G, g of x is defined as a function of x. So its derivative has to be a function of x, which implies that this is f of x. Now, what we did is a whole bunch of mathematical kind of shell gamery here. We got crazy with our variables, which can get really, really confusing. But what we want you to understand, what I want you to understand, is to realize that what we just proved, if we can prove this right here, then what we've proven is that the integral is actually the antiderivative. Because if I take the derivative of an antiderivative, I should get my function back. And that's exactly what we're doing. Now, I'm going to prove this, and then I'm going to go through a couple of really quick examples, and then everything's going to be done in class, because you can't spend too much time on this, okay? Now, check it out. Proof. The proof is really cool. All right, here we go. Here's my proof. So, first things first. Suppose g of x equals the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Remember, you, you you always get free information, right? And that's the suppose part, right? There's the hypothesis and the conclusion. So we always get to grab that first part. So again, um, let's put it over here because we got a little more room. I'm going to keep this much simpler. I'm going to have some function, which I'm going to call f of t. Whoops, 
f of t, and this is going to be a, and this is going to be b, and x is any value for, it's going to be some value between a and b. All right, well, that'll just be floating there. We'll use that down the road. Now, here's what I have to show. All I have is this, and then what I have to show is that g prime of x equals f of x. So, let's look at, let's look at g prime of x. Well, last time I checked, any time that I have to show that a derivative equals something else, since there's no clever way for me to do this, I can't do this with implicit differentiation or, you know, something funky, then I've got to unfortunately go through the whole of the limit as h approaches 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. Now, what is that really? So we're going to deal with just this limit term. So limit as h approaches 0 of, well, g of x plus h, what is that? Well, if g of x is defined in this way, then isn't g of x plus h just the integral from a to x plus h, right, of f of t, t, dt, minus the integral from a to x, because that's what g of x is, of f of t, dt, and this is all over h. Well, hopefully by now, if this is x and this is x plus h, and I integrate from a to x plus h, I get all this good stuff in here. And then if I subtract out the integral from a to x, then won't I be left with just that? And how could I rewrite that? That's easy enough, isn't it? I could just write this as the limit as h goes to 0. <clears throat> Excuse me of the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt all over h. Okay? Now, I'm about to do something a little bit crazy here. All right? I'm about to do something funky. I'm going to need a little more, a little more room to do it. 